Well, really, I've been making records since 1984, so 21 years. But as far as making records under my own name since 1991. And I've had periods in that in these 15 years where it seems like I could do no wrong, and then I've peri had periods where it seems like I could, do, I could do no right. And it's a strange process to be caught up in, because at the end of the day, I just feel like I'm a weird little guy who goes into my studio and makes music. You don't have to know anything about Moby to have an opinion about him. You don't have to listen to his music. You could just know that he's that bald Christian vegan guy. Moby caught a moment in time when everyone was looking the other way and um, he just dropped this record. He honestly should be a comedian, but you'll never know it because you think of sober Moby with the glasses and the serious music. He has probably, I would say, five to ten people who he plays all his stuff for, whose opinions he really takes seriously. We made fake music videos because we were sure that there was going to be a time where he'd need one. And we did fake interviews where he and I would set up interviews so that he would know how to work in front of a television and what he looked like. So how do you want to shoot this? One of the fallacies of wealth and one of the things that drives our culture is that belief that happiness is just around the corner when you have the perfect house or when you have the perfect car or a, a new tennis court or a new pair of jeans or what have you and that sort of happiness is really short-lived. He just isn't going to play the part that he's supposed to play as a rock star which I think is great. When I make music now, I, I, I can't help but end up making music that sounds like the music I grew up loving.
I first became aware of him through the single Go. It was the track that built Moby's career. Go turned up as a 12 inch and um, I think just, just instantly made an impact. I mean, I happen to be a particular train spotter fan of um, Twin Peaks anyway. In moments of idleness, Moby would sit there and, and start playing the theme to Twin Peaks, those very memorable haunting chords. I remember walking uh, into the studio one evening and hearing him fooling around with that and, and just going, this is it, Moby, this is absolutely it. So I get a letter from David Lynch saying, I've heard go and, um, you know, we're suing you. <laughs> Moby did something that I think probably sets him apart from most people, which is instead of getting a lawyer and going after David Lynch's people or doing some craziness like that, he just casually wrote a letter to David Lynch saying, I'm obsessed with your show and, you know, I love this character and, you know, um, I'd really appreciate it if you let me use this song in, you know, or this, your song in my song. And I think a couple days later, he got a letter from David Lynch saying, okay, you know, no problem. Do what you want to do. You know, glad you like the show. So, and I just remember at that point thinking, wow, this is, you know, he's really, he's really going to do something. This lovely puke green building behind me is the first apartment I ever lived in here in New York City. And I moved in, I guess it was 1990. And this neighborhood back then was really, really seedy. It's still pretty seedy, but you've got that Chinese restaurant uh, that used to be a Cuchi Frida house, selling the most disgusting smelling deep fried Mexican food. And then you've got a pharmacy right there that was a 24 hour sex shop. And then, this was a brothel. And when we first moved in here, I had a very, very small room. Uh, it was basically just enough space for a bed and a desk where I had my studio. And this is where I wrote a lot of my early electronic music. Uh, I mean, Go was originally written here. But then I moved my equipment down the street to Instinct Records. After we decided to work together, Moby, myself, uh, and another partner in the record label at the time, we sort of pooled all the equipment and gear that we had and we set up a little miniature recording studio in what was my living room at the time. And we sort of turned Moby loose in there while I was off at work during the day uh, earning my living. Uh, Moby would be spending his days in the studio. And I think it was about a year into the relationship that he came up with the track that was called Go. It was part of the first EP we released by Moby. It was called the Mobility EP. And there were four tracks on of them. One of them was Go. Are you feeling all right? I said, are you feeling all right? This was kind of the burgeoning of dance music, kind of the, don't ask me for dates, um, late 80s, early 90s. And it, there was really something very different about what Moby, just about that track. It had a very special atmosphere to it that, that really was, you know, set it really completely apart from all the other things that were going on at the time. First time I heard his name was when I bought this absolutely wonderful track called Mobility, where he had the actual very first version he did of Go as well. Um, 
and I really, really fell in love with that, with that single. Put your hands in the air, everybody! Go! The first time that I came to Paris was in 1987. I had a a French girlfriend, well her, her father was French and her mother was American so she spoke English and French fluently and she had grown up here and I had never really left the United States and I remember coming here in 1987 and being so incredibly nervous because I had never left the United States and I was a very provincial kid from Connecticut. <laughs> I think it's a great achievement and uh, we just wanted to uh, share that with you and to congratulate you for uh, that achievement. It's, it's only the beginning, we all believe, but we uh, wanted to take some time to give you your platinum record for hotel. So uh, this is uh, from everyone in the company. This is uh, for you and very, very proud to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, between now and November, my hope is to learn how to speak French well. <laughs> because my on-stage French... Thin. I can only say cette prochaine chanson s'appelle so many times. So I'll learn how to speak French. And, uh, but as of right now, je, je suis un homme de France. <laughs> that make any sense? Yes. Okay. He has become now a very popular, um, very popular musician in France. If I had to sort of try and deconstruct the success that I've had in France, part of it is musical. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of it was on play sampling old African-American vocals because the French have always had a long love affair with, you know, sort of indigenous African-American music. I think part of it's also my politics. The fact that I've been so outspoken in my criticism of the Bush administration and sort of my criticism of American culture in general, I think that that's endeared me to a lot of French people. He's one of the rare artists who is doing so many shows in France and uh, we will prove that he was right to agree. Merci, Eric. Merci Moby. I have no idea what sort of music I'd be making if I hadn't grown up in and around New York City. Uh, I mean, all the music I loved growing up was either from the UK or it was from New York. And you can just think of the 70s, like from 1973 to about 1979 or 1980. I mean, in New York, you saw the birth of punk rock with the New York Dolls. Uh, you saw the birth of hip hop the birth of early electro, um, this huge disco movement. I mean, New York is such an amazing musical melting pot. I think of myself as being so incredibly fortunate to have grown up 45 minutes away from New York City so I could constantly be exposed to such dynamic music scene. You know what's cool? What? To like look at the car in front of us and with the zoom thing go up forward to it, it looks like you're gonna hit it. Yeah. Darien's, it's a small town, it's about 25,000 people. The vast majority of people who live here are presidents of corporations, CEOs. It's a very affluent, very conservative, very Caucasian, very culturally homogenous place. I mean, when I was growing up, there were no African-American families in Darien. 
there were no Jewish families in Darien. There were no Latino families in Darien. Like, it was basically 90% Protestant, 10% Catholic. So the, you know, the Catholics were the, the minority. <sighs> Darien. How quickly well, can you get out, I think, is the quick is yeah. the answer to that. This is Connecticut. Land that I love. Stand beside me and guide me. Moby was born at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which is at, what, 125th Street, I think? Jim was a, a teaching assistant, that's his dad, and Betsy was, um, I think, taking a, a few classes. They were very young. Jim was killed in a car accident when Moby was very young. I don't think he was much more than 15 or 16 months old when, uh, yeah, when he had the accident. Yeah. And she, Betsy and Moby came to live with my parents at that point. They moved back and lived in the house in Darien. Lord, it don't leave me my relationship with my mother was very complicated because she was a very complicated woman. Uh, I mean, on one hand, we were very good friends. You know, we would go to the movies together, and we would hang out together, and we'd watch TV together, and we would talk about popular culture, and we would talk about politics. And this is from a very early age, from the time I was about seven or eight. But she had a lot of emotional issues and emotional problems as well. And being the only child of a woman with emotional issues and emotional problems, of course, I bore the brunt of that. So it was a difficult upbringing because I never knew who I was going to get. You know, sometimes I would come home from school and my mom would be happy and we'd be friends. And sometimes I'd come home from school and she would just be angry and screaming and throwing pots. And I had never had a clue as to what was influencing this. And, and then sometimes I'd come home from school and she'd be just sort of almost catatonic and indifferent. So it was difficult. She wanted to get her own life, hard to believe. But I mean, she was uh, in her early 20s and living at her parents' house. I don't think she was very happy. So that's the house that my grandparents owned that I spent, you know, on and off about eight years living in. And it's changed a lot because when I was growing up, we didn't really have lawns. Everything was sort of overgrown and ramshackle. The house was a little bit falling apart. Now it looks a lot more conventional. We didn't have the white picket fence. When I lived with my grandparents, it was my mother, and myself and my grandmother and my grandfather. My grandfather would disappear at six in the morning and go into the city and then come back at seven at night and have a few gin and tonics and go to sleep. So I didn't see, I, I saw my grandfather on weekends and I saw a lot of my grandmother because she didn't work. You know, she was a housewife. And so my mother was either unemployed or working as a secretary. And so when I'd come home from school more often than not, my grandmother would be here. And then I had my, my aunts and my uncles who would stop by. And occasionally my mother would have a boyfriend who would, you know, be unemployed and need somewhere to live. So he would, you know, live here. And uh, I don't know, it wasn't, it wasn't such a bad life. He was, you know, the one of, if not the poorest kid in an incredibly affluent area of Darien. Um, I mean, I grew up the same way. I mean, I was the kid with the canvas shoes that had to last me a year in Fairfield, Connecticut, where, you know, I would be taking the bus to school as a high school senior, and there were freshmen showing up in brand new Porsches. We're here at Royal School, which is where I went to grammar school from the time I was four or five until about the time I was 11 or 12. My teachers were all idealistic hippies. So I grew up in this very right-wing, very conservative town where all of my teachers were full of the idealism of the 60s. And so they encouraged us to be creative. They encouraged us to be you know, independent and sort of autonomous in our thinking. And as a result, I'm, like, I have my issues with Darien, but I'm 
eternally grateful that I had a pretty good education here. I can have the sun come and touch me on my shoulder. I started playing music when I was about nine years old, and I really wanted to be a singer. And I tried out for the school choir here, and I guess there may be 50 or 60 people in my class, and everyone was accepted into the school choir, except for myself and two other people. So during choir time, we would get sent to the library to read quietly while everyone else sang. Some things fall apart Some things make you whole Some things that you find Are beyond your control this is the fun part about making a, a documentary about your life, is you get to go back and see places that you never thought you'd see again. I don't think that my mother necessarily influenced me musically or guided me. What she did is cr she created an environment where I was free to be as creative as I wanted to be. When I started sitting down and banging on a piano, she encouraged me to play piano. When I started, you know, banging on a guitar, she encouraged me to take guitar lessons and to play guitar. When I started a band, she said, oh, why don't you guys rehearse in the basement? So it was the fact that she encouraged me to be as musical and creative as I wanted to be. She thought that Moby was very bright and very creative and didn't want to squash that, didn't want to not allow him to, to at least pursue any kind of creative outlets. And, mm -hmm. She thought I was a genius. <laughs> well, she did. She told oh, me that. I know. Certainly, I think growing up in the 70s, I mean, this was the time of Watergate, and I come from a very politically oriented family, and my teachers were all very political. And yeah, we were encouraged to be sort of as opinionated and outspoken as we wanted to be. And I remember in 1976, Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford. And most of the kids ended up sort of supporting the political candidate that their parents supported. So needless to say, the majority of the people here supported Gerald Ford, the Republican. And I remember I saved up money and I tried to buy people's allegiance. So I said that anyone who was willing to get their parents to vote for Jimmy Carter, I'd give them a quarter. So it's a good thing I didn't pursue a career in politics because I'd probably be in jail right now. I had assumed that America would always be this very progressive, very civic-minded place. Um, and I was just dismayed over the last five or 10 years to see how conservative and how right-wing the United States has become and how misogynistic and homophobic popular culture has become and how provincial, like willfully provincial and ignorant so many Americans have become. And I know that might sound like a nasty thing to say, but you just look at the last election and how people turned a blind eye to the truth. I don't pretend to be an expert on American sociology, but there does seem to be two cultures there, really. You know, one uh, which goes up and down the coasts, um, which is more cosmopolitan and metropolitan, but it's the entire rest of the country, which is primarily uh, small towns and, and rural people. So, yeah, I mean, America is a very, very conservative society, as we've seen in the last four years. I broke a lot of laws here. The first time I ever smoked marijuana was in the woods back over there. The first time I ever got drunk was in this former playground right over there on, on Creme de Mont. Okay. Oh. I mean, the reason you can drink it is because you can't taste the alcohol. But then suddenly, three hours later, you, you know, you're at home throwing up with your head in the toilet. So yeah, a lot of laws were broken here. We broke a lot of windows when we were young. We would come here and throw rocks through the windows. They built Darien High School in the 50s, and they built it, and it would have been a perfect building had it been built in California or somewhere warm. But unfortunately, this is the Northeast, and it's cold and snowy, and so it was all glass and not very well insulated, so it was a really cold, energy-inefficient building. And the truth be told, even though I'm fond of it because I went to school here, it was an ugly, ugly building. I think he was fine, you know, a fine student. But he talked about always being in the audiovisual room and 
Um, right, right. Um, his friends would like to play chess, and so they were nerdy. As there are now, there are kids that Always are interested in, in, in doing, they call them, now they call them the techies. Not, they don't call them nerds anymore, they call them techies. And I was a forlorn, depressed, lonely teenager, but in hindsight, it was a nice time. Uh, I mean, I was playing in a punk rock band, and I would have all these unrequited crushes, and I felt disconnected from, you know, sort of like the school and the social milieu that I was ostensibly a part of, but it was, it was okay. Different colors, different shades, over each mistakes were made. I've done my bit. My first ever performance with the band AWOL when I was 16 years old was right here, playing to seven-year-olds and our parents and a few random people who just happened to be walking by. When he was first playing in a band, it was just they used awful. To <laughs> well, awful or not, they were just loud. Playing in bands was great because it was social and you could get ideas from your other musicians but you always had to wait for people to show up and especially in high school where you know the guitar player had a girlfriend the drummer had an after-school job uh, the singer was on the swim team and also had an after-school job so it was always difficult trying to actually find time when everyone could rehearse and the greatest thing about multi-track recording for me was I could do everything myself and I could, I could work you know, at, at two in the morning or I could work when I first woke up or I could work for eight hours straight and I just didn't have to wait for other people. When I first left home, I moved here to Greenwich and Greenwich is about 40 minutes away from New York City and it's just an absurdly affluent place. I mean, it's like the Bahrain of the United States. And I lived with a friend of mine who was a youth minister at Christ Episcopal Church and this is one of the first places I ever DJed at a place called The Cafe, which is just right back there. No alcohol was served, so if you were underage, this was a place you could go and dance and hang out. So it was mainly people between the ages of about 15 and 20. So if you were 16 years old and you were into skateboarding or punk rock or new wave, or if you were gay, or if you were in any way involved in any alternative lifestyle, this is where you came. I met Moby. Uh, underage nightclub in Greenwich which is kind of a church-run youth organization, which is the aspect of it we tried to glaze over. There was a talk beforehand. It was a lot like a university lecture that we hadn't had the privilege to have. They would talk about, you know, some sort of uh, topical um, situation like condom use in high schools. And it was started by someone named Bruce Marchfelder who was interested in doing youth work, but in an alternative avant-garde way. He would, at the end, sort of wrap it up into some Christian theme. And then we would push the chairs aside and um, boogie down for the next, like, three or four hours, and Moby was the maestro because he was the one and only DJ. And we got to listen to punk rock and The Cure and, and Joy Division and uh, flirt. In Greenwich, Connecticut, there are really no um, interesting options for kids other than maybe like drinking and walking up and down Greenwich Avenue. <laughs> and I guess there's added significance to this in that it was the Bush family church because the Bush clan are originally from Greenwich. So for a brief period in time, I found myself living next door to the Bush family compound here in Greenwich where the Bush clan originated from and DJing here at Christ Episcopal Church, which was the Bush family church, which is where they would come on Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter. If you live in Greenwich and you have a two-bedroom house on a tenth of an acre, it would cost you around a million dollars. So when you talk about the wealth of the Bush family and you realize they have about 3,000 acres of fenced-in property, 
um, I mean, that's, that's, it's wealth that you and I can't even begin to conceive of. So, I mean, you just very simply do the math. So if a tenth of an acre costs a million dollars, what does 3,000 gated, wooded, beautiful acres cost? I started out DJing here, and I also DJed at a nightclub in Port Chester, New York, which is about 10 miles from here. Port Chester is very Latino, very working class, heroin addicts and students and punk rockers and truck drivers, whereas here it was a lot, you know, affluent kids from the suburbs. So I learned pretty quickly how to gauge what people wanted. People wanted hip hop, but they also wanted punk rock songs. They wanted country western, but they would also want weird jazz music. People would want disco and house music. And so you had to figure out a way in six hours to play all these different types of music to make everybody happy and keep myself interested and keep my job. Thank you guys, you're wizards. Um... Well, if you all bear with me for a second, my friend Lee Malazzo came up from New York today. The music was great. I mean, Moby's DJing skills at, at that time were, um, were incredible. It wasn't very lucrative. I think I was making on average between six and eight thousand dollars a year, but I was living in an abandoned factory for most of that time, so my expenses weren't too high. It was illegal to live here, and I had no running water, and I had no bathroom, and no heat, but you could pay off the security guards. Now, it might not look like it, but it's actually quite gentrified from what it was. Because when I lived here, there were crack dens and people were getting shot. So now we have to uh, try and break in to the floor that I lived on. I lived on the second floor. So once I get in, I'll come down and un unlock the door over there. Yep, nothing's changed. George. Okay. So, nothing has actually changed here, which is I'm kind of surprised by. So gentrification has not hit 200 Henry Street. So originally this floor in the 70s was uh, a place where the military made film strips, like how to assemble a helicopter. They moved out I think in the late 70s and so they just left this empty abandoned space. And I was the only tenant on the hall, so even though my space is down here and it was very small, I had all this empty space to play with, so I used to ride my skateboard here. And one thing I found is that while I was living here, I had a few different girlfriends. And not surprisingly, none of them were also very keen on spending the night here in the middle, you know, an abandoned factory in the middle of a cracked neighborhood with no running water. my home for three years. Someone has come in because I had a loft bed up here and they tore that down. And my friend Paul and I, because originally there was a drop ceiling right around here, and so we tore out the drop ceiling and found old plywood and two by fours and nailed them together to make the wall. But because we were not great carpenters, we had to also staple, you'll see, you can, we had to staple cardboard up there as well to try and keep air from coming in. And uh, my studio was set up right over here. And where you're standing is where my kitchen was. Kitchen consisting of a plastic tub and a little hot plate. Dirt or steam? Ew. Ew, you come, you come with me. 
Oh, the bathroom's pretty photogenic too. Just for the hell of it. This, uh, when I say that I had no running water, um, I had no running water in my space, but I did actually have this bathroom. So for three years, this is, uh, this is where I, I bathed and brushed my teeth. Looks exactly the same, except there were bugs back then, like these cockroaches as big as mice. My days when I lived here, I would work on music during the day, maybe run a couple of errands. But basically, yeah, work on music for eight or nine hours a day, six or seven days a week, and then I'd practice DJing as well. And I was playing drums in a little punk rock band at the time called The Pork Guys. So that was my whole life. Living here for three years in the late 80s had a huge impact on the music I was making. Because in the early 80s, I was more into punk rock and new wave. But then I sort of discovered hip hop and house music. And this neighborhood, that's all you heard. I mean, you heard hip hop and merengue and salsa and dance hall and house music. And it made other musical genres at the time seem so provincial, you know, because I would go out to nightclubs, whether it's a hip hop club or an R&B club, and I would be the only white person there. And everyone was dancing and covered in sweat and having the most fantastic time. And, then I, and I'd go to a rock club and people were sitting around staring at their shoes. Aha, uh -huh. sophisticated traveler. And then uh, my friend Damien talked me into moving into New York City. We need to be in the middle of the city. And I'm going to find an apartment because I couldn't get him to come. I couldn't get him to get interested or involved in, in actually making that leap. And uh, he said, that's fine. I'm not paying more than $300 a month rent. <laughs> I guess it was in 1988, this nightclub Mars opened up and it was without question the most remarkable, coolest nightclub in New York. I mean, it was six levels and they had a rooftop and every night you came here, there were hundreds of people just desperate trying to get in and they would have the velvet ropes and they would have the glamorous door person sort of picking people, you know, for who was allowed to come in and it had the best sound systems anyone had ever heard and all the best DJs played here. And I gave my demo tape to Yuki Watanabe, who was in charge of the music here. And luckily, Yuki wasn't from New York, so he didn't know about the sort of patronage system that applied to DJs. In order to DJ somewhere, you had to know someone. So he actually listened to my demo tape, and he liked it, and he gave me a job DJing here. And my first night DJing here is probably, professionally, one of the most exciting things I've ever experienced. Suddenly, I found myself DJing at the most remarkable place in all of New York. Granted, I was DJing in the basement, <laughs> and there weren't too many people down there, but still, it was my first time having left Connecticut to come to New York City and DJ. Mars was an incredibly exciting club. There was one floor of every single type genre imaginable at the time, sort of on the far fringes of the west side. And what was then the meatpacking district. If you were walking out on the street at three, four in the morning, uh, carcasses of beef were getting slung around by the truckers loading up all the warehouses. When I started DJing here, this area was known for tons and tons of transvestite hookers and meat processing. And the smell, it, it's honestly, in all my life, I've never smelled anything worse than what this neighborhood smelled like in the middle of the summer in 1988 or 1989. And it was just the smell of like pig guts and blood and beef innards and lamb, all just rotting in garbage bags for days on end.
Now, the funny thing is when Moby was DJing at Club Mars, Moby was a hip hop DJ. And this is one of the things that floored me, his versatility right from the get go. He had the turntable techniques, the control, the scratching, everything, and he always had just a mob of kids around him just trying to see what he was doing and how he was doing it. I love to DJ. I get really caught up in the, you know, just in the seamless mixing of records. So you'll have three records going at the same time, bringing in parts from one record, bringing in parts from the other record. And then I started bringing a drum machine and a synthesizer and a sampler and sort of setting up almost like a live electronic setup. So I would be playing records, mixing in my own music. So you could actually completely control the atmosphere of the room and even the song to the way people were reacting. Being a skinny white guy from Darien, there's no reason to think that he would be, you know, as serious as he was, but he's a master technician, he's an incredible ear. I've never heard anybody in New York like mix as beautifully or as intelligently as Moby can. And then I got a call on a Thursday night from Yuki saying that his main floor DJ had canceled and could I play on the main floor, which to put it in like theatrical terms, that's the equivalent of being in the chorus line and getting a call the day before saying like, oh, and our, our lead actor has broken his leg, you're gonna have to do the lead actor's part. Playing at Mars, the people who were coming to hear me DJ were for the most part gay, black, and Latino. And, and I, I loved that. A straight man goes to a nightclub and his, the entire time he's there, he's searching around for that right woman and he's then got to spend hours buying her drinks and, you know, I don't know, presenting himself as a desirable catch. Whereas a gay man can go and dance until five in the morning and on his way out see another, you know, single man say, oh, you want to go home? Okay, fine. At least that's, that's always what I've observed. So I think the reason that, you know, gay clubs tend to have better music is because the people there are actually paying more attention to what the DJ's playing. I really liked what he was doing and I said, well, wow, this is really cool. Um, have you thought about trying to, you know, organize some of this? Have you thought about, you know, creating a song and, or making a single? You know, it was like the dam was unleashed at that point in time. He really did just get it. And he started creating tracks just at an incredible pace. He's so prolific. I mean, he just really turned it out all the time. So here we were in a situation where we had just manufactured and produced this first track by Moby, the Mobility EP, and suddenly he had four more tracks that were fantastic and ready to go. It seemed to just be this wellspring of ideas and music, and so it was just like single after single, and that music came really fast. We did what a lot of dance producers did at the time and released under quite a few names. Moby, Voodoo Child, Barracuda, Brainstorm. This song is called Ah Ah. All the while that we were releasing tracks under some of these other names, the Mobility EP began to take on life of its own and to grow legs. He did certain gigs where three people would show up, and that was fine with him. And he's always, he's always been that way. In the 70s, well, the 60s and the 70s, this building, I think, was a bank. And then in about 1985, someone bought the bank and turned it into a nightclub and called it MK. And it was really glamorous, like the exact opposite of Mars. I mean, because we're on Fifth Avenue and it was this beautiful limestone building and it was this fantastic nightclub. 
And at CMJ, the College Music Journal Festival in 1989, I performed here and it was my first ever electronic music performance in New York City. And now it's a carpet store. This back here used to be the Peppermint Lounge and the Peppermint Lounge was a fantastic nightclub. It was one of the first places I came to in New York and I saw Echo and the Bunny Men here in 1981 or 82. And now it's an express clothing store. I think the second place I ever performed or did an electronic music performance was here at La Palace de Butte. And it was also the first place I was ever a club promoter. And now what used to be La Palace de Butte is Petco supplies, fish, and grooming. And one of the most remarkable venues or nightclubs in New York was the Palladium. And it was a big, beautiful old theater. And in the early 80s, I used to come here to see concerts. I mean, I saw the Boomtown Rats here, and I saw Simple Minds here, and XTC, and Joan Jett, and Jules Holland, and the Millionaires. It was a really gorgeous, beautiful old theater. But in true New York fashion, the big, beautiful Art Deco Palladium venue nightclub is now a featureless brown NYU dorm. He played at, um, I think it was the Tunnel in the city, and it was one of his like first sort of shows, not as a DJ, but as a performer. It wasn't like this sold out show or anything. I don't even think it was really advertised. And he got me the job of standing at the front door and counting people that came in. So I wanted to look cool, so I didn't wear my glasses that day. And I would just count people by the bodies that were moving in. And a bunch of people came up to me and they go, oh my God, I can't believe who just came in. And it was Madonna. I didn't know who she was because I couldn't see, you know, six inches in front of my face. <laughs> and when I realized that Madonna and her whole crew was there to specifically see Moby perform, I thought, God, you know, there's really something here. Wherever I saw him play, I mean, I saw him play in New York and, and a lot in Europe, he was, somehow, even though he wasn't well known at the time, he was somehow catching the audience and just taking it completely. It was quite amazing. People were really ready for him in Europe, and that's just, I guess, speaks to the fact that America is a bit more um, slow to take on new things. We got into this taxi, and the driver, who was I don't know, maybe 35, 40 years old, turned around and said, are you Moby? And the guy pulled out the single Go and asked him to autograph it in the cab. And I was like, you know, who do you think you are? <laughs> Signing albums in a taxi cab in London. The UK is still relatively small to the US and, and that's one of the joys of the UK that you can, you can get a kind of nationwide um, impact on a record. Um, relatively quickly, whereas in America, if you have a hit, you tend to have to go state to state to have kind of national success. So it often surprised American artists like Moby when they came over and found out that, you know, that they were, you know, something was going on here. But I think, it, you know, inspiring for them, exciting for them. And suddenly we were in a position where his career was taking off and growing leap and leaps and bounds. And as a small label, we probably weren't able to support him in the way that he felt he needed to be supported to get where he felt he was going. This song is called Next to the E. What do we do next? How do we work towards an album? And at the same time, how do we keep our relationship from falling to pieces? And somehow from amidst all this turmoil, Moby came up with the track, Next is the E. Which I thought was, again, an absolutely sensational track, another of his, his monster tracks. Um, and that became the last track that he recorded and released with us as a single. The 
1995, I made this very eclectic record, Everything is Wrong, and slightly got typecast as more of an electronic musician, dance musician. People like things neatly packaged in, it's an indie rock band, it's a dance act, it's a whatever. From my perspective, a musician or an artist should be comfortable in a lot of, working in a lot of different musical idioms. Everything is wrong, we, we used to listen to, yeah, 95, 96, um, a kind of after hours clubbing. Um, this was the year that I left school and kind of um, generally messed around and got into techno for the first time. When you get things that are as varied as that, and as broad as that, or as deep as that, the initial response from certain people is quite, it's quite hard to get your head around it in a way, because people want easy answers to everything. People don't give the time for um, people to express themselves. You know, everything's like, hey man, it's a da 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 you know, and you're cool or not cool within a second. Looking back on it, quite weird combination of this kind of um, almost neoclassical, more ambient um, stuff, and then the uh, real kind of rave classic stuff as well. But I don't think that record could be made at any other time because it's still got the kind of traces of the first wave of rave music. But then, but it's also kind of getting into something new. And we started the process, I think, which a long process, which is still going on, of people under trying to of people understanding that Moby is very broad in his, in, in his artistic ability and, and he's going to use that breadth and he's not going to just cater to, to become a certain kind of artist just because that's what the world expects at any particular moment in time. really dim-witted career-killing move, I made the album Animal Rights, which alienated just about everybody. You listen to these and think, oh, that's an interesting way of looking at the world. Oh, that's a sound that I hadn't thought of. Oh, punk rock and dance music together, not a lot of people doing that. It wasn't very well received by his fans or by the critics or by the media in general, radio, you know, so it was kind of a low point, I would say. There was a bit of an electronic dance kind of breakthrough in America with Prodigy and Fatboy Slim and Chemical Brothers. It all started to do really well, just at the time when Moby was doing Animal Rights. And it seemed like just at the moment when he could have really captured that market in theory, he was going off in a completely different direction, just as the market was catching up with him. He very much was an artist. He talked like an artist. He looked like an artist. He performed like an artist. Of course, Animal Rights is my favourite record. Of all the records I've made, it's the only one I actually go back and listen to. So even though it was a dim-witted, career-killing move, artistically I was really happy with the results. I think his, his kind of switch to artist almost was, was, was too soon um, and kind of alienated, I suppose, or just, just disenfranchised himself from, from the audience that he, that he grabbed their attention with Go. For the longest time, record companies were independent entities and musicians who were signed to record companies were allowed to be creative and they were allowed to be idiosyncratic and the people who ran the record companies realized that musicians who were being creative and idiosyncratic actually had a much better chance of making great records that would sell well. And what happened 
in the 80s, 90s, and continuing into this millennium is that all the record companies have been bought up by major label, I mean major corporations, who rather than looking at the success of a record over the course of a couple of years, they look at the quarterly, you know, they look at the success of a record every three months. And that is the death of the music business, where someone gets signed because they look and they sound like everything else on MTV or on the radio. They're encouraged to dress the way everyone else dresses. They're encouraged to make music that will instantly sound fine on the radio. And if their record doesn't become successful immediately, they're dropped. And if, if that was how record companies made records 30 years ago, we never would have had Prince, we never would have had Fleetwood Mac, we never would have had Bruce Springsteen, we never would have had Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, we never would have had Led Zeppelin, we never would have had the Rolling Stones, we never, I mean, the reason that I've been able to have a career is primarily due to Daniel Miller and Mute Records, because Daniel's ethos in approaching music is let artists be artists, you know. So Daniel loves, Daniel Miller loves records that sell well, but most of his artists make records that don't sell particularly well, but that are really great records. And so now I'm very clear on that point that I'm only here because of Mute Records. He was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine section one Sunday of 30 artists under 30 who are going to change the world or whatever. So, I mean, that's pretty spectacular to have your son on the cover of the New York Times Magazine section. He had Everything is Wrong and um, animal a couple rights, of or... Animal Rights. Yeah. A couple of his earlier CDs were already out and getting a lot of, uh, getting quite a bit of attention. Um, so, you know, she really did fortunately live to see him. It's starting. Betsy was very proud of him. And meanwhile, Betsy had met her second husband, Richard, and he and Moby were very good friends. And Richard just thought Moby was wonderful too. So they, they as a certain more adult family, were very strong with each other. Moby's father died when Moby was an infant. So I think in the case with his mom's death, that it speaks volumes how kind of private and silent he was about that, I'm sure. She was sick every time we yeah. got together. You know, just not feeling well, coughing. And so when she called us uh, to say that she had been diagnosed with lung cancer, she had been, up till that point, she'd been already been sick a lot, a lot. But it was a, it was a huge shock. It oh, was, yeah. It was, oh. it was horrible. As far as how my mother's death affected me, as strange as this might sound, for the 15 years before she died, she and I were friends. And we would talk once a week, once every two weeks. We would see each other every couple of months. But our relationship had really gone from being parent-child, because our parent-child relationship was very unconventional to begin with. And so for the last 15 years of her life, we were, we were pals. And I know he asked Betsy if she wanted him to stay around, and she said no. I remember that very clearly. And, and it wasn't until the last few weeks before she died that she really started going downhill. And then Moby came towards the end of that afternoon, I think, and that afternoon she died. She, so Richard and Moby were with her when she died because they said she opened her eyes and looked at them and then died, just like that. As odd as this might sound, I didn't feel like I was losing a parent. I felt like I was losing a very close friend. And I mean, certainly, emotionally, I responded the way anyone would respond losing their parent, but the longer term repercussions were more just like missing, some, missing a friend I was very close to. I think there was just, a, there was, you know, there was obviously a special bond between him and his mother and, and you know, a big loss when she passed away. Very early on when I met him, I remember when talking to him, suddenly realizing that this was somebody who was a very, very adamant Christian. And I remember thinking, well, I don't understand. He's got strong convictions, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call him a, a you know, a, a, like a born again Christian. No, no I, not at all. At all. I think he has uh, strong beliefs, but I've never, I, he's never talked to us about Jesus Christ or being born again or 
salvation or any of that. I think he's very interested in almost any form, any kind of religion. Um, Philosophy, too. He's a self-described Christian, but it's his, his own form of Christianity. My faith and my spirituality, I'm not saying it's better or worse than anybody else's, but it's really weird. You know, so when people call me a Christian, I don't know what they mean. Because the word Christian means so many different things to so many different people. I mean, one person says Christian and they think of Roman Catholicism. Another person says Christian, they think of some crazy fundamentalist Bible Belt person. Or Christian means Eastern Orthodox or Mormon. And my own Christianity is predicated on my belief that, you know, we're these short-lived, weird biological creatures on a planet that's five billion years old in a universe that's 15 billion years old that is vast beyond anything we can even imagine. It's almost impossible to make an empirical case for human significance. So when I talk about spirituality, or God, I have no idea what that means. So on a very simple, subjective, personal level, and a level that I'll never argue about with anyone, I somehow see Christ as being divine. But from my own personal human perspective, what the grand ontological, cosmological truth of that statement might be, I have no idea. And that's why I think it's absurd when people argue about spirituality or theology, because it's the equivalent of ants arguing about computers. You know, it's, they're talking about stuff that we just are incapable of understanding. And I think it's part of the conflict at his core that makes him, you know, the person that he is. There's, there's definitely uh, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, uh, and they're having a big fight, and Moby's head is in the middle. And as a result, all kinds of incredible creative things uh, are the result. When I was working on play, this might sound overly simple, but I wanted to make a record that people would like. Because Animal Rights was a very abrasive record, and it was a very aggressive record. And so with play, I wanted to make something that was warmer and more inviting. It would be possible to say that maybe people had written him off after Animal Rights, and uh, it's people in dance music, people in pop music as a whole are always looking for something new, and then and when um, uh, somebody has fallen from grace, that's probably the worst possible position to be in. He played me Natural Blues, which was the first thing I'd heard him do in that kind of sample, using blues samples, and I thought he was very excited about it, and I was very excited about it. I said, this is, this is great, this is the, you know, he said, he said he thought that was the kind of direction he wanted to go in general, and I said, that's brilliant, you know. Making play took about two years, and it was a very painful, very frustrating two years because I was never happy with the songs, I was never happy with the way they were mixed, I was never happy with the way they were produced. I tried mixing them in many different studios with many different engineers and ended up just coming back here and mixing it myself. With play, he was kind of, it was worse than actually coming from a standing start because he probably had to win back a lot of. Uh, people in the media who would uh, perhaps already have written him off. But I mean, it, it's a, one of the best examples of, you know, you're, you're only as good as your current album and um, Play was a brilliant record and it didn't matter in the end at all. People look back at Play as being this critically lauded record, but the truth is when Play was released, most journalists wouldn't even review it. Play, by the way, got zero out of 10 in the Melody Maker. You should be, you should be aware of. And they, they gave it, they really wanted to destroy Moby. They gave him a full page review, lead review in Melody Maker, and it was zero out of 10. The LA Times review, when Play was released, said one of the songs is called Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad? And the answer is because I have to listen to this record. We were like that, that's it. And uh, so Moby licensed a few songs and they 
the songs appeared in a few of the right places and suddenly it just got on a completely new gear and started taking off. You know, apart from a little bit of play in Germany, it wasn't getting radio play anywhere. And the only way we had to get people to listen to music was through licensing it to movies, TV shows, and advertisements. We want to get this music exposed, and that's how we got it exposed, you know. The first time that I got the sense that play was going to be successful was when Pete Tong played Why Does My Heart Feel So Bad, and then talked about how much he liked it. I started to work with um, Danny Boyle and Andrew McDonald on, on the beach and started to do a soundtrack with them. And it came up in conversation about, this, you know, Danny thought this, this record was quite interesting. And I, and I was in kind of slightly embarrassed, I hadn't really heard it. <laughs> you know, because I was you know, working with Danny for the first time and um, he's uh, quite an inspiring guy and he's very, very passionate about his music. So I kind of, you know, <laughs> almost bluff my way along. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got it somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's pretty good. Yeah, it's Moby, yeah. And I was kind of half thinking, God, he hasn't had a, you know, I haven't done anything decent since Go. So I listened to play for the first time properly in the, in the back of this car. Um, and I yeah, just went through it and just thought it was totally amazing. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that it was out. I couldn't believe that it was a printed, finished CD and I hadn't really got to hear about it. And it just it just seemed obvious that this, we, should, we should have some of this music in the film. And I played it to Fox, they were excited about it. They put porcelain in a very early cut of the film, actually. I came back to the UK and then I was kind of on a mission. <laughs> it was like, right, we all got to play catch up here on Moby and then just started banging out tracks for the, from the album. Normally you go C list, B list, you know, then if you're very lucky, you go onto the A list. We went from C list to A list one week. And I thought, fucking hell, that's, you know, okay, fasten your seatbelts, you know. It was one of the first times um, I actually like heard a Moby track just in a restaurant. And I think it was Honey or something like that. And, uh, and we were all like, yeah, that's, oh, awesome, this is great, like they're playing the song. And he, he looked at me and he was like, this is gonna be a big album, you know, get ready. The world was really ready for that at that moment. But at the same time, I don't think that's why it was successful. My father loves to play. He heard it in the car one day. One of my sisters left it in the CD player and he couldn't even wrap his head around it. Had no idea if this was a 20 person collective all singing on the album or if this was one person sampling, but he loved it and it was all we heard for months. I was totally impressed. <laughs> I, was, I mean, I thought it was just fabulous. I just yeah. thought it was, yeah. it was wonderful, and it was just like nerdy little Moby, you know. It was like the, the perfect package, you know. And then a year or so later, they start sending me platinum discs and thank yous, and you know, and and saying that you know I broke Moby in the UK, but I, I didn't, you know, really. I, I just I always say I kind of just helped it along. And to be totally fair, Danny Boyle was the person. Without that conversation. Um, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> so, I have to give the disc to Danny Boyle. <laughs> the first show that he played was at Toad's Place in um, New Haven, Connecticut. 
and we were in the back room, this dinky little back room, and he said, oh, I really like this first band that's coming on. Let's go out and see the first band. And he and my wife Cindy and I and the couple of the, the record people that we were with walked out, and he got mobbed, like, you know, like the Beatles. It's just a circle of people all like scrambling over one another to try to touch him or get his autograph or something. And they all, the bouncers had to, you know, bring us all into the back, into the back room. And I remember sitting down on the bus with him afterwards and he said, well, I guess, you know, I can't go see the opening band anymore. <laughs> it's the end of that. It got to be sort of a joke in the family too, because we'd start going to his concerts and end up being the oldest people there. <laughs> and when he was, um, my husband and Anne and Joseph, I couldn't go, but they went to a concert and Joseph and David had brought folding chairs with them. That's and, the concert I mean, that's the one. Yeah. And they were walking into the field to set up their chairs. And someone came over and, and said, um, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're gonna sit here and watch Moby. He said, you're going to be trampled to death if you stay. It was in the, it was in the middle. They, they were, were in the middle, middle of the, the mosh pit. pit. If you've had huge success, there's something liberating about it, because you don't need to go back and recreate it. Of course, in the eyes of the record company, in the eyes of the critics, in the eyes of other people, everything you do after the huge success will be deemed a failure. But from my perspective, I never expected any sort of success. So everything after the huge success is just like, you know, more, you know, hot fudge sauce and cherries on top of the sundae. I thought there, were too, there was too much emphasis on sampled vocals on 18 and not enough on, because he was right, already starting to write really good songs and there's quite a few that didn't make it, which were great songs, which ended up on Hotel, for instance, um, Dream About Me and Raining Again, two great songs that he'd written that I really felt should have been on, uh, on 18 that didn't end up there. He said uh, to me, this is, uh, this is an album that I, I'd like people to just kind of put on in the background and have a dinner party too. You know, I mean, I just think that's such a, uh, a pleasant way to put an album out. So there was quite a lot of discussion. I think 9-11 happened in the middle of all that. And I think that had an effect on him, very had a major effect on him and how he felt that the album, the mood of the album should be. September 11th is my birthday and I remember waking up early September 11th because the phone was ringing and I remember lying in bed thinking who in their right mind would call me so early on my birthday and the phone kept ringing and the phone kept ringing and finally I picked it up and it was my friend Damien screaming incoherently that one of the Twin Towers had been hit by a plane and then all of a sudden I heard, because I lived quite close to where the Twin Towers were, I heard the second tower get hit and I ran up on my roof and saw them on fire and it was one of those moments where I just wasn't prepared for, like, like you're not prepared to stand on your roof and look up and see the Twin Towers engulfed in flame. And then when they fell, again, they had been a part of the skyline since I was seven years old. And then suddenly to have this huge hole in the skyline, our brains are not prepared to deal with things like that. Buildings don't just fall down in the course of an hour. But after September 11th, Every single person living in New York City at some point asked themselves the question, do I want to still live here? And a lot of people left. And I understand, you know, people with families, people with small children, they didn't feel safe and so they left. But I had this moment of quite emotional loyalty and I thought to myself, well, here's this city and by my estimation, the most remarkable city in the world, a city that has given me everything. You know, it's given me music and it's given me whatever success I've had and it's given me my friends. It's given me you know, a fascinating place to live. How in the world could I ever think of leaving this city at its, in its one time of need? The city that's been around for hundreds of years and for a few weeks, it's vulnerable. How could I think of leaving? I would rather have died in New York than lived anywhere else, which was a strange sort of loyalty I didn't even know I had. Just to watch you perform the greatest game. 
George Bush didn't have a presidency before September 11th. I mean, without September 11th, his presidency was doomed. He butchered the economy. He proved himself to be inept as far as dealing with uh, you know, all of our allies. Uh, September 11th is the only thing that has enabled George Bush to have a presidency. And he's used it and abused it and manipulated it to political gain in a way that I find utterly distasteful. You know, he's, here's a man who essentially was a draft dodger or a man who went AWOL from his military service standing up and pretending to be a patriot. He's political, but not in the way that Bono or somebody like that is, because he's not populist. Bono is very populist in his political things. He says he makes big, broad political statements that like make poverty history. Yeah, well, sure. Well, everybody wants to make poverty history. I can, everybody can buy into that. Do you know what I mean? But. Um, uh, you know, Moby's more specific. Aww. And he just isn't going to play the part that he's supposed to play as a rock star, which I think is great. And um, so he'll say, he'll say what he believes, he thinks, and not what the media would like him to say. Whatever his personal beliefs or views, he doesn't necessarily wear them on his sleeve and he doesn't diminish who you are um, for not sharing those beliefs. And I became a vegetarian 21 years ago, and then soon after became a vegan. Uh, and the main reason I became a vegetarian is my simple belief that I love animals. I don't want to be involved in any action that would cause suffering to animals. Uh, I mean, I'm not judgmental. You know, my friends eat meat, and I, just as I hope that they'll respect my lifestyle choices, I in turn respect their lifestyle choices. We started teeny because we wanted a place to go ourselves and we wanted a place that our friends could enjoy and we wanted it to be in our neighborhood and we wanted a place where we could both eat our vegetarian and vegan food. When Kelly and I were dating she was working at Human Rights Watch and she wanted a change and I'd always wanted to open a little tea shop. Uh, I mean the name is a pun you know T-N-Y we serve tea we're in New York we're very small and we wanted to focus on tea because it's good for you and it tastes nice and it has this fantastic history. Uh, and you can be a tea connoisseur and spend $5. It's not obvious when you walk in that it's a vegetarian place with lots of vegan stuff. It, we want it to be a place where everybody feels comfortable. We don't guilt trip people by having pictures of tortured cows in the bathroom or anything like that. We, you know, it's, it's, it's very personal. Many vegetarian restaurants are great for vegetarians, but non-vegetarians don't willingly go there. And the nice thing about Teeny is I'd say about half the people who come here aren't vegetarians and might not even know that we're a vegetarian restaurant just because the food is so nice. When I read interviews, I, I notice that the people who are asking the questions are always stir steering the conversation towards his strong Christian beliefs and his strong vegan beliefs and a lot of times they don't bother to ask him about anything else. I met Moby in 2000, um, the fall of 2000. My magazine at the time was receiving an award for its um, gay coverage in the magazine and showing homosexuals as being just a part of society and um, because I thought he was gay <laughs> I asked him to present the award and he was flattered. He said yes. He came to the awards and about two minutes before he was about to get up and present the award, he went, you know I'm not gay, right? <laughs> no! I have no idea. I had no idea. <laughs> um, very awkward. If people's misconceptions of me are benign, I can't worry about them too much. And and also, I mean, like the myth, the, for my entire life and for my entire career, people have thought I was gay. And honestly, I, I take that as kind of like a badge of, I wear that as a badge of pride. Because I, you know, I grew up going to gay clubs and I live in New York City, which one of the things I'm proud of of New York is that same-sex couples can walk down the street holding hands and kissing and feel comfortable. You know, I've got about 40 or 50 CDs worth of material on my, on my laptop. Uh, of demos, sketches, ideas, songs, instrumentals, just from the last album. With Hotel, I wrote about 300 songs, some of which had samples, some of which were very unconventional, some of which were punk rock songs, some of which were very disco-oriented. 
Sometimes you get a CD full of material, you know, twice a week. The songs that ended up on Hotel were just my favorites of the ones that I'd written during that period. So it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious choice or an effort to make a sample-free record or to make a departure. It was just this was the record that just came out of me. Moby always followed his path, and sometimes following what you believe in, which is moving on and, you know, carry on your life, sometimes can disturb, disturb people that feel um, uh, confident with one thing and, and are scared of the unknown. I suspected when I heard Hotel that he was consciously trying to move in a more sort of singer-songwriter direction and a more traditional structure and that sort of thing. Okay, he doesn't have like, you know, a traditional singer's voice, but either did David Bowie. You know, when you think about it, either did Morrissey, you know, and what Moby has that so few people today in the music business, so many, so few artists have, is his songs have like sensitivity and feeling. And you know, that's one of the things I loved growing up, listening to Depeche Mode, listening to the Smiths. It's like it made your heart ache. And I think that's what this record does. And his voice is so, it's heart-wrenching. There's a lot of melancholy just from being alive. You know, just going about what our daily business, we're exposed to a lot of sadness. And for me to be an honest artist, I can't pretend that's not the case. And I mean, specifically with Hotel, because it is sort of a relationship-oriented record, the relationship that I had while I was making Hotel was falling apart in fits and starts. And I think that really informed a lot of the sadness and a lot of the melancholy that made, it, made its way onto the record. I've had to learn how to, you know, play the instruments and write the songs and do the engineering and do the production and do the arranging. And that's all a function of just making records by myself. Uh, I mean, arrangement, especially if you're writing simple songs, arrangement is a huge part of it. I mean, think of a song like Helpless by Neil Young, which is three chords, or Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner, which is three chords, or some Rolling Stone songs, which are two chords or three chords. And it's dynamics and arrangement. I mean, the song Lift Me Up, which is three chords, but then you write different string parts that are sort of interweaving around the chords, and you have choruses that are big and dynamic and verses that are very small and quiet and you have drum parts that change and you have different instruments that come in and out and that's you know the complexity in a song Well, we are here in Santiago, Chile. Chile is a fascinating country because it's quite narrow. It's only 100 kilometers wide, but yet it's something like 8,000 kilometers long, which is the equivalent of being as narrow as Rhode Island, but as long from basically Boston to Seattle. Uh, it's the most prosperous country in South America and one of the most economically stable. Before being here, we had been in 
Peru and Colombia and Venezuela and Panama and Mexico. And all of those places are wonderful places, but they're all quite poor. And getting off the plane in Chile and driving to the hotel, you, it, you felt as if you'd sort of stepped through a time portal and were suddenly in Switzerland. Like everything was clean and everything was contemporary and everything was in relatively good shape and the roads weren't falling apart. So it, it, it definitely made it seem that Chile was sort of the Switzerland of South America. You get a lot of people that they'll go to their, their first Moby show and uh, they'll be completely surprised. Uh, you know, they'll think it's going to be some really kind of mellow, like atmospheric kind of show. And then uh, you get on stage and the, the intensity kicks in and it's just like, bang, everyone's like jumping up and down and like there's all this like emotion and chaos and after the show they're like I had no idea it was gonna be like that at all. The live show now, it's a very diverse show. I mean, at times it's like a rave, at times it's like a punk rock concert, at times it's like a revival, at times it's like seeing a you know weird blues band playing ballads. So I am kind of amazed that people put up with the live show and actually seem to enjoy it just because it's so diverse. I mean, and I'm amazed that I get away with it. He learned a lot from being a DJ and how to, to play live and the balance of it and how to really build an audience up. He's really comfortable, always has been, in front of other people. And I think people who are performers tend to be that way, not because they learn to be that way, but because that's the situation that they want to be in, they gravitate to. He creates the rave atmosphere. He creates a party, but it also has this community thing to it. you feel it now. What is Moby at like 35 going to be like? 40? Where is he? What's he doing? Have a wonderful night. Good night. Thank you.